Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everybody have a seat. Have a seat. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm glad things have cooled off a little bit. I know folks were hot. Uh, uh, you know, we're here today to talk uh, about taxes, something that uh, everybody obviously cares deeply about. And I've often said that our biggest challenge right now uh, isn't just to reclaim all the jobs that we lost to the recession. It's to reclaim the security that so many middle class Americans have lost over the past decade. Our core mission as an administration and as a country uh, has to be, yes, putting people back to work, uh, but also rebuilding an economy where that work pays off. An economy in which everybody can have the confidence that if you work hard, you can get ahead. Now, what's holding us back from meeting these challenges, it's not a lack of plans, it's not a lack of ideas. It is a stalemate in this town, in Washington, between two very different views about which direction we should go in as a country. And nowhere is that stalemate more pronounced than on the issue of taxes. Many members of the other party believe that prosperity comes from the top down, so that if we spend trillions more on tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans, that that will somehow unleash jobs and economic growth. I disagree. I think they're wrong. I believe our prosperity has always come from an economy that's built on a strong and growing middle class, one that can afford to buy the products that our businesses sell, a middle class that can own homes and send their kids to college and save enough to retire on. That's why I've cut middle class taxes every year that I've been president by $3,600 for the typical middle class family. Let me repeat, since I've been in office, we've cut taxes for the typical middle class family by $3,600. I wanted to repeat that because sometimes there's a little misinformation out there and folks get confused about it. Uh, moreover, we've tried it their way. It didn't work. At the beginning of the last decade, Congress passed trillions of dollars in tax cuts that benefited the wealthiest Americans more than anybody else. And we were told that it would lead to more jobs and higher incomes for everybody and that prosperity would start at the top, but then trickle down. And what happened? The wealthy got wealthier, but most Americans struggled. Instead of creating more jobs, we had the slowest job growth in half a century. Instead of widespread prosperity, the typical family saw its income fall. And in just a few years, we went from record surpluses under Bill Clinton to record deficits that we are now still struggling to pay off today. So we don't need more top-down economics. We've tried that theory. We've seen what happens. We can't afford to go back to it. We need policies that grow and strengthen the middle class, policies that help create jobs, that make education and training more affordable, that encourage businesses to start up and create jobs right here in the United States. So that's why I believe it's time to let the tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans, folks like myself, to expire. The, the, and by the way, I might feel differently, because it's not like I like to pay taxes. I might feel differently if we were still in surplus. But we've got these huge deficits, and everybody agrees that we need to do something about these deficits and these debts. So the money we're spending on these tax cuts for the wealthy is a major driver of our deficit, a major contributor to our deficit, costing us a trillion dollars over the next decade. 
By the way, these tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans are also the tax cuts that are least likely to promote growth. So we can't afford to keep that up, not right now. So I'm not proposing anything radical here. I just believe that anybody making over $250,000 a year should go back to the income tax rates we were paying under Bill Clinton. Back when our economy created nearly 23 million new jobs, the biggest budget surplus in history, and plenty of millionaires to boot. And this is not just my opinion. The American people are with me on this. Poll after poll shows that's the case. And there are plenty of patriotic and very successful, very wealthy Americans who also agree, because they know that uh, by making that kind of contribution, they're making the country as a whole stronger. At the same time, most people agree that we should not raise taxes on middle-class families or small businesses, not when so many folks are just trying to get by, not when so many folks are still digging themselves out of the hole that was created by this great recession that we had, and at a time when the recovery is still fragile. And that's why I'm calling on Congress to extend the tax cuts for the 98 percent of Americans who make less than $250,000 for another year. If Congress doesn't do this, millions of American families, including these good-looking people behind me, <laughs> could see their taxes go up by $2,200 starting on January 1st of next year. That'd be a big blow to working families, and it would be a drag on the entire economy. Now, uh, we can already anticipate, we know what those who are opposed to letting the high-end tax cuts expire will say. They'll say uh, that we can't tax job creators, and they'll try to explain how this would be bad for small businesses. Um, let me tell you, uh, folks who create most new jobs in America are America's small business owners. And I've cut taxes for small business owners 18 times since I've been in office. I've also asked Congress repeatedly to pass new tax cuts for entrepreneurs who hire new workers and raise their workers' wages. But here's the thing that you have to remember. The proposal I make today would extend these tax cuts for 97 percent of all small business owners in America. In other words, 97 percent of small businesses fall under the $250,000 threshold. So, so th th this isn't about taxing job creators. This is about helping job creators. I want to give them relief. I want to give those 97 percent a sense of permanence. I believe we should be able to come together and get this done. While I disagree on extending tax cuts for the wealthy because we just can't afford them, I recognize that not everybody agrees with me on this. On the other hand, we all say we agree that we should extend the tax cuts for 98 percent of the American people. All right, everybody says that. The Republicans say they don't want to raise taxes on the middle class. I don't want to raise taxes on the middle class. So we should all agree to extend the tax cuts for the middle class. Let's agree to do what we agree on, <laughs> right? That's what compromise is all about. Let's not hold the vast majority of Americans and our entire economy hostage while we debate the merits of another tax cut for the wealthy. We can have that debate. We can have that debate, but let's not hold up working on the, the thing that we already agree on. In many ways, the fate of the tax cut for the wealthiest Americans 
will be decided by the outcome of the next election. My opponent will fight to keep them in place. I will fight to end them. But that argument shouldn't threaten you. It shouldn't threaten the 98 percent of Americans who just want to know that their taxes won't go up next year. Middle-class families and small business owners, they deserve that guarantee. They deserve that certainty. It will be good for the economy, and it will be good for you. And we should give you that certainty now. We should do it now. It will be good for you. It will be good for the economy as a whole. So my message to Congress is this. Pass a bill extending the tax cuts for the middle class. I will sign it tomorrow. Pass it next week. I'll sign it next week. Pass it next, next, oh, you get the idea. <laughs> as soon as that gets done, we can continue to have a debate about whether it's a good idea to also extend the tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans. I'll have one position, the other side will have another, and we'll have that debate. And the American people can listen to that debate. And then next year, once the election's over, things have calmed down a little bit. You know, based on what the American people have said and how they've spoken during that election, we'll be in a good position to decide how to reform our entire tax code in, in a, a simple way that lowers rates and helps our economy grow and brings down our deficit. Because that's something that we're going to have to do for the long term. But right now, our top priority has to be giving middle class families and small businesses the security they deserve. You're the ones who are driving this recovery forward. You're the ones who are driving this recovery forward. And I think it's time to widen the circle of opportunity and help more Americans who work hard to get ahead. It's time that we learn the lessons of our past and lay the foundation for a better future. And that's what I'm focused on every day, and I hope Congress will join me in doing the right thing. So thank you very much all for being here. Thank you. My administration is focusing on our economy uh, and how do we make sure that this is an economy in which uh, people who work hard, who act responsibly, uh, can get ahead. This is a particular challenge uh, right now. We're seeing some of the weaknesses in Europe. And uh, it is a perfect time for us to focus on what are steps we can take now, not later, not uh, a year from now, but right now, uh, to strengthen the middle class, put more people back to work, uh, and provide business uh, greater certainty. And yesterday, the Senate voted to ensure that 98 percent of Americans don't see their taxes go up next year, that 97 percent of small businesses don't see their taxes go up next year. Uh, it was the right thing to do. It will provide certainty and security to families who are already feeling pinched. Uh, because of the economy, it will be good for the economy as a whole. And now, uh, the only thing that is going to prevent the vast majority of Americans from not seeing a tax increase next year uh, is if the House doesn't act. Uh, we need 218 votes in the House of Representatives, 218 votes in the House of Representatives to make sure that 98 percent of Americans don't see their taxes go up next year. And so one of the things that I'm going to be doing, my cabinet members are going to be doing over the next several days, is to make sure that the American people understand uh, that we can provide them certainty right now for next year that their taxes will not go up. And they will then be able to plan accordingly. Small businesses will be able to plan accordingly, knowing that uh, We've taken a whole bunch of uncertainty out of the economy uh, at a time when uh, the global economy uh, is 
experiencing a number of disruptions. So uh, again, I would urge the House of Representatives to do the right thing, and I'm going to make sure that uh, my cabinet members amplify that message uh, in the days to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everybody, please have, please have a seat. Except you guys. Don't, don't sit down. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. You, you know, there's been a lot of talk here in Washington uh, about the deadlines we're facing on taxes and deficits. Uh, these deadlines are going to be coming up uh, very soon, in the coming weeks. Uh, but today's important because uh, I want to make sure everybody understands this debate is not just about numbers. It's a, a set of major decisions that are going to affect millions of families all across this country in very significant ways. And their voices, uh, the voices of the American people, have to be part of this debate. And so I asked uh, some friends of mine here to, to join me, uh, some, some folks uh, uh, from here uh, in the area. Our ultimate goal is an agreement that gets our long-term deficit under control in a way that is fair and balanced. That kind of agreement would be good for our businesses, it would be good for our economy, it would be good for our children's future. And I believe that both parties can agree on a framework that does that in the coming weeks. In fact, my hope is to get this done before Christmas. But the place where we already have, in theory at least, complete agreement right now is on middle class taxes. And as I've said before, we've got two choices. If Congress does nothing, every family in America will see their taxes automatically go up at the beginning of next year. Starting January 1st, every family in America will see their taxes go up. A typical middle-class family of four would see its income taxes go up by $2,200. It's $2,200 out of people's pockets. That means less money for buying groceries, less money for filling prescriptions, less money for buying diapers. <laughs> it means a tougher choice between paying the rent and paying tuition. And middle-class families just can't afford that right now. By the way, businesses can't afford it either. Yesterday, I sat down with some small business owners who stressed this point. Uh, economists predict that if taxes go up on the middle class next year, consumers will spend nearly $200 billion less on things like cars and clothes and furniture. And that obviously means fewer customers. That cuts into business profits. That makes businesses less likely to invest and hire, which means fewer jobs, and that can drag our entire economy down. Now, the good news is there's a better option. Right now, as we speak, Congress can pass a law that would prevent a tax hike on the first $250,000 of everybody's income. Everybody's. And that means that 98 percent of Americans and 97 percent of small businesses wouldn't see their income taxes go up by a single dime. 98 percent of Americans, 97 percent of small businesses would not see their income taxes go up by a single dime. Even the wealthiest Americans would still get a tax cut on the first $250,000 of their income. So it's not like folks who make more than $250,000 aren't getting a tax break, too. They're getting a tax break on the first 250, just like everybody else. Families and small businesses would therefore be able to enjoy some peace of mind heading into Christmas and he heading into the new year. And it would give us more time than next year to work together on a comprehensive plan to bring down our deficits, to streamline our tax system, to do it in a balanced way, including asking the wealthiest Americans to pay a little more so that we can still invest in things like education and training and science and research. Now, uh, I, I know some of this may sound familiar to you because we talked a lot about this during the campaign. This shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. This was a major debate in the presidential campaign and in congressional campaigns all across the country. And a clear majority of Americans, not just Democrats, 
but also a lot of Republicans and a lot of independents agreed we should have a balanced approach to deficit reduction that doesn't hurt the economy and doesn't hurt middle class families. And I'm glad to see, uh, if you've been reading the papers lately, that more and more Republicans in Congress seem to be agreeing with this idea that we should have a balanced approach. So if both parties agree we should not raise taxes on middle class families, let's begin our work with where we agree. The Senate's already passed a bill that keeps income taxes from going up on middle class families. Democrats in the House are ready to vote for that same bill today. And if we can get a few House Republicans to agree as well, I'll sign this bill as soon as Congress sends it my way. I, I, I got to repeat, I've got a pen. <laughs> I'm ready to sign it. So, so my point here today is to say let's approach this problem with the middle class in mind, the folks who are behind me and the millions of people all across the country who they represent. You know, the American people are watching what we do. Middle class families, folks who are working hard to get into the middle class, they're watching what we do right now. And if there's one thing that I've learned, uh, when the American people speak loudly enough, uh, lo and behold, Congress listens. You know, uh, some of you may remember that a year ago, during our last big fight to protect middle class families, tens of thousands of working Americans called and tweeted and emailed their representatives asking them to do the right thing. And sure enough, it worked. Uh, the same thing happened earlier this year when college students across the country stood up and demanded that Congress keep rates low on their student loans. Congress got the message loud and clear, and they made sure that interest rates on student loans did not go up. So the lesson is that when enough people get involved, we have a pretty good track record of actually making Congress work. And that's important because this is our biggest challenge yet, and it's one that we can only meet together. So uh, in the interest of making sure that everybody makes their voices heard, last week we asked people to tell us what would a $2,000 tax hike mean to them. Some families told us it would make it more difficult for them to send their kids to college. Others said it would make it tougher for them to cover the costs of prescription drugs. Some said it would make it tough for them to make their mortgage. Uh, Lynn Lyon, who's here from Newport News, where's Lynn, there she is. She just wants to see some cooperation in Washington. She wrote, let's show the rest of the world that we're adults and living in a democracy, we can solve our problems by working together. So that's what this debate's all about. And that's why it's so important that as many Americans as possible send a message that we need to keep moving forward. So today, I'm asking Congress to listen to the people who sent us here to serve. I'm asking Americans all across the country to make your voice heard. Tell members of Congress what a $2,000 tax hike would mean to you. Call your members of Congress, write them an email, post it on their Facebook walls. You can tweet it using the hashtag My2K. Not Y2K, <laughs> My2K. We figured that would make it a little easier to remember. Uh, and, and, and I want to assure the American people I'm doing my part. Uh, I'm sitting down with CEOs. I'm sitting down with labor leaders. I'm talking to leaders in Congress. You know, I, I am ready and able and willing and excited to go ahead and get this issue resolved in a bipartisan fashion so that American families, American businesses have some certainty going into next year. And we can do it in a balanced and fair way, but our first job is to make sure that taxes on middle class families don't go up. And since we all theoretically agree on that, we should go ahead and get that done. If we get that done, a lot of the other stuff is going to be a lot easier. So uh, in light of just sort of spreading this message, I'm going to be visiting Pennsylvania on Friday to talk uh, with folks at a small business there that uh, are trying to make sure that uh, they're filling uh, their Christmas orders. And I'll go anywhere and I'll do whatever it takes to get this done. Uh, it's too important for Washington uh, to screw this up. Now's the time for us to work on what we all agree to, which is let's keep middle class taxes low. 
That's what our economy needs. That's what the American people deserve. And if we get this part of it right, then a lot of the other issues surrounding deficit reduction in a fair and balanced and responsible way are going to be a whole lot easier. And if we get this wrong, the economy is going to go south. It's going to be much more difficult for us to balance uh, our budgets and deal with our deficits because if the economy is not strong, uh, that means more money is going out and things like unemployment insurance and less money is coming in in terms of tax receipts and it just actually makes our deficit worse. So we really need to get this right. I can only do it with the help of the American people. So tweet, uh, what was that again? My 2 K. Tweet, tweet using the hashtag My2K or email, you know, post it on, on a member of Congress's Facebook wall. Do what it takes to communicate a sense of urgency. We don't have a lot of time here. We've got a few weeks to get this thing done. We could get it done tomorrow. Uh, now, optimistically, I don't think we're going to get it done tomorrow. <laughs> but I tell you, if, if everybody here uh, goes out of their way to, to, to make their voices heard and spread the word to your friends and your family, your coworkers, your neighbors, uh, then I am confident we will get it done. And we will put America uh, on the right track, uh, not just for next year, but uh, for many years to come. All right? Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. It is good to see all of you. Hello, Hatfield. It is good to be back in Pennsylvania. And it is good to be right here at Connex. Uh, I, I want to thank Michael Aronson, Robert Glickman, and the inventor of Connex, Joel Glickman, for hosting me today and giving me a great tour. Where'd they go? Where'd they go? I want to. Stand up, stand up so everybody can see you guys. There they are. There you go. And I just noticed we got a couple of outstanding members of Congress here. We got Shaka Fatah and Allison Schwartz. Now, I just finished getting a tour of the Connects workshop. Uh, I have to say, uh, it makes me wish that. Joel had invented this stuff a little sooner when I was a kid. Uh, back then, you couldn't really build a roller coaster out of your erector set. Um, and I also got a chance to meet some of the folks uh, who've been working around the clock uh, to keep up with the Christmas rush. And that's a, that's a good thing. You know, th these, these guys are Santa's extra elves here. Uh, they manufacture almost 3,000 Connects pieces every minute. And every box that ends up on store shelves in 30 countries is stamped Made in America. And that's something to be proud of. That's something to be proud of. So. By the way, uh, I hope the camera folks had a chance to take a look at some of the connects, including that flag made out of connects. Uh, and you know, Joe Biden was in Costco. He wanted to buy some of this stuff. <laughs> but I told him he had too much work to do. Uh, I wasn't going to have him building roller coasters all day long. Uh, now, uh, of course, Santa delivers everywhere. I've been keeping my own naughty and nice list uh, for Washington. Uh, so you should keep your eye on who gets uh, some connects uh, this year. There are going to be some members of Congress who get them and some who don't. <laughs> but look, this is a wonderful time of year. Uh, it's been a few weeks since a long election finally came to an end. Uh, and obviously, I, I couldn't be more honored uh, to be back in the White House. Uh, but. I'm already missing the time that I spent uh, on the campaign visiting towns like this and talking to folks like you. We love you. I love you back. That's why I miss it. Uh, and, you know, one, one of the benefits of traveling and getting out of the White House is it gives you a chance to have a conversation with the American people about what kind of country do we want to be and what kind of country do we want to leave to our kids. 
I believe America only thrives when we have a strong and growing middle class. And I believe we're at our best when everybody who works hard has a chance to get ahead. That's what I believe. And I know that's what the founders of this company believe as well. We were talking uh, about uh, these guys' dad, and who, who I understand just passed away at the age of 101. Uh, which, uh, so these guys have good genes, uh, in, in addition to inventive minds. And, and the story of, of generations starting businesses, hiring folks, making sure that if you work hard, you can get ahead, that's what America is all about. And that's at the heart of the plan that I've been talking about all year. I want to reward manufacturers like this one and small businesses that create jobs here in the United States, not overseas. I want to — and by the way, this is a company, one of the few companies in, in the toy industry that have aggressively moved jobs back here. You know, that, that's, a, that's a great story to tell. Because we, we've got the best workers in the world and the most productive workers in the world. And, and, and so we need champions for American industry creating jobs here in the United States. I want to give more Americans the chance to earn the skills that businesses are looking for right now. And I want to give our children uh, the kind of education that they need in the 21st century. I want America to lead the world in research and technology and clean energy. I want to put people back to work rebuilding our roads and our bridges and our schools. And I want to do all this while bringing down our deficits in a balanced and responsible way. Now, on this last point, you've probably heard a lot of talk in Washington and in the media about the deadlines that we're facing on jobs and taxes and investment. This is not some run-of-the-mill debate. This isn't about which political party can come out on top in negotiations. We've got important decisions to make that are going to have a real impact on businesses and families all across the country. Our ultimate goal, our long-term goal, is to get our long-term deficit under control in a way that is balanced and is fair. That would be good for businesses, for our economy, for future generations. And I believe both parties can and will work together in the coming weeks to get that done. We know how that gets done. We're going to have to raise a little more revenue. We've got to cut out spending we don't need, building on the trillion dollars of spending cuts we've already made. And, and if we combine those two things, we can create a path where America's paying its bills while still being able to make investments in the things we need to grow, like education uh, and infrastructure. So we know how to do that. But, you know, in Washington, nothing's easy, so, uh, you know, there's going to be some prolonged negotiations. And, and all of us are going to have to get out of our comfort zones to make that happen. I'm willing to do that. I'm hopeful that enough members of Congress in both parties are willing to do that as well. We can solve these problems. But where the clock is really ticking right now is on middle class taxes. At the end of the year, middle class taxes that are currently in place are set to expire. Middle class tax cuts that are currently in place are set to expire. There are two things that can happen. If Congress does nothing, Every family in America will see their income taxes automatically go up on January 1st. Every, every family, everybody here, you'll see your taxes go up on January 1st. I mean, I, I'm assuming that doesn't sound too good to you. That's sort of like the, the lump of coal you get for Christmas. That's a Scrooge Christmas. A typical middle-class family of four would see their income taxes go up by about $2,200. That's for a typical family. It would be more for some folks. That's money a lot of families just can't afford to lose. That's less money to buy gas, less money to buy groceries. It, in some cases, it means tougher choices between paying the rent and saving for college. 
It means less money to buy more connects. <laughs> yeah. Just the other day, economists said that if income taxes go up on the middle class, people will spend nearly $200 billion less in stores and online. And when folks are buying fewer clothes or cars or toys, that's not good for our businesses, it's not good for our economy, it's not good for employment. So that's one path. Congress does nothing. We don't deal with this looming tax hike on middle class families. And starting in January, everybody gets hit with this big tax hike. And businesses suddenly see fewer customers, less demand. The economy, which we've been fighting for four years to get out of this you know, incredible economic crisis that we have, uh, it's, uh, it starts stalling again. So that's one path. The good news is there's a second option. Right now, Congress can pass a law that would prevent a tax hike on the first $250,000 of everybody's income. Everybody. So that means 98% of Americans, 97% of small businesses wouldn't see their income taxes go up by a single dime, right? Because 98% of Americans make $250,000 a year or less. 97% of small businesses make $250,000 a year or less. So if you say income taxes don't go up for any income above $250,000, the vast majority of Americans, they don't see a tax hike. But here's the thing, even the top 2%, even folks who make more than $250,000, they'd still keep their tax cut on the first $250,000 of income. So it'd still be better off for them too, for us to go ahead and get that done. Families would have a sense of security going into the new year. Companies like this one would know what to expect uh, in terms of planning for next year and the year after. That means people's jobs would be secure. The sooner Congress gets this done, the sooner our economy will get a boost. And it would then give us in Washington more time to work together on that long-range plan to bring down deficits in a balanced way. Tax reform, working on entitlements, and asking the wealthiest Americans to pay a little bit more so we can keep investing in things like education and research that make us strong. All right, so, so those are the choices that we have. And understand, this was a central question in the election, maybe this, the central question in the election. You, you remember, we talked about this a lot. <laughs> it, 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 it wasn't like uh, this should come to anybody to surprise to anybody. We had debates about it. There were a lot of TV commercials about it. And at the end of the day, a clear majority of Americans, Democrats, Republicans, independents, they agreed with a balanced approach to deficit reduction and making sure that middle class taxes don't go up. Folks agreed to that. Now, the good news is we're starting to see uh, a few Republicans coming around to it, too. I'm talking about Republicans in Congress. So the reason I'm here is because I want the American people to urge Congress soon, in the next week, the next two weeks, to begin the work we have by doing what we all agree on. Both parties agree that we should extend the middle class tax cuts. We've got some disagreements about the high end tax cuts, right? Republicans wanna, don't want to raise taxes on folks like me. I think I can pay a little bit more to make sure that kids can go to college and we can build roads and invest in NIH so that uh, we're finding cures for Alzheimer's. And that's a disagreement that we're going to have and we've got to sort out. But we already all agree, we say, on making sure middle class taxes don't go up. So let's get that done. Let's go ahead and take the fear out for the vast majority of American families so they don't have to worry about $2,000 coming out of their pockets starting next year. The Senate has already passed a bill to keep income taxes from going up on middle class families. That's already passed the Senate. Your members of Congress, like Allison and Chaka, other Democrats in the House, they're ready to go. They're ready to vote on that same thing. And if we can just get a few House Republicans on board, we can pass the bill in the House. It will land on my desk. 
and I am ready. I, I've, got, I've got a bunch of pens ready to sign this bill. I'm ready, ready to sign it. I'm ready to sign it. There are no shortage of pens in the White House. And I, and I carry one around for an emergency just in case, just waiting for the chance to use it to sign this bill to make sure people's taxes don't go up. But you, well, I, I, don't thank me yet because I haven't signed it. I need, I, I need some help from Congress. So uh, the key is, though, that the American people have to be involved. Uh, you know, it, it's not going to be enough uh, for me to just do this on my own. So I'm hopeful that both sides are going to come together uh, and do the right thing. Uh, but we all know you can't take anything for granted when it comes to Washington. Let's face it. Uh, and that's why I'm going to be asking for all of you to make your voices heard over the next few days and the next couple of weeks. I need you to remind members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans, to not get bogged down in a bunch of partisan bickering, but let's go ahead and focus on the people who sent us to Washington and make sure that we're doing the right thing by them. So I want you to call. I want you to send an email post on their Facebook wall. Uh, if you tweet, then use a hashtag we're calling My2K. Not Y2K, My2K. All right? Because it's about your 2K in your pocket. <laughs> we're, try we're, we're trying to burn that into people's minds here. So in the meantime, I'm doing my part. Uh, I'm meeting with every constituency group out there. Uh, we're talking to CEOs. We're talking to labor groups. We're talking to civic groups. Uh, I'm talking to uh, you know, media outlets, just explaining to the American people this is not that complicated. Let's make sure the middle class taxes don't go up. Let's get that done in the next couple of weeks. Let's also work together on a fair and balanced, responsible plan so that we are paying our bills. You know, we're, we're not spending on things we don't need, but we are still spending on the things that make us grow. That's the kind of fair, balanced, responsible plan that I talked about during the campaign, and that's what the majority of Americans believe in. So uh, I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm going to need folks like you, the people here in Hatfield and here in Pennsylvania and all across the country, uh, to get this done. And a lot's riding on this debate. Uh, this is too important. Uh, to our economy, it's too important for our families uh, to not get it done. And it's not, a, it's not acceptable to me, and I don't think it's acceptable to you, for just a handful of Republicans in Congress to hold middle class tax cuts hostage simply because they don't want tax rates on upper income folks to go up. All right? That, that, that doesn't make sense. If your voices are heard, then we can help businesses like this one. We're going to sell a whole bunch of connects. Uh, let's, uh, let's give families all across America the kind of security and certainty that they deserve during the holiday season. Let's keep our economy on the right track. Let's stand up for the American belief that uh, each of us have our own dreams and aspirations, but we're also in this together. Uh, and we can work together in a responsible way, uh, that we're one people and we're one nation. That's what this country is about. That's what all of you deserve. That's what I'm fighting for every single day, and I will keep fighting for as long as I have the privilege of being your president. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. God bless America. I want to, first of all, just thank Tiffany and uh, Richard, uh, Jimmy, and Delma uh, for opening up their beautiful home to us. Uh, the reason that we're here is because Tiffany is one of the people who responded to my 2K. Uh, as many of you know, we asked uh, folks all across the country to talk a little bit about what would it mean if uh, their income taxes went up in 2013. Uh, and uh, Tiffany, who's uh, a 
high school teacher, uh, responded. Uh, her husband, uh, Richard, uh, works at a Toyota dealership. Uh, they actually live with uh, Tiffany's parents, uh, both of whom are still working. Yes. And so uh, what Tiffany pointed out was that uh, an increase of $2,000 or so uh, for her and uh, her husband uh, in this household would actually mean $4,000 uh, that was lost. Uh, and uh, a couple of thousand dollars means a couple months rent uh, for this family. And the story they tell about working hard, uh, my understanding is they're interested in starting uh, a business uh, as well as uh, the work that they currently do. Uh, they've got dreams and ambitions. They've got uh, a beautiful uh, six-year-old son, uh, Noah, uh, who's back with great-grandma. Uh, and, and they're keeping it together. They're working hard. They're uh, meeting their responsibilities. Uh, you know, for, for them to be burdened unnecessarily because Democrats and Republicans aren't coming together to solve this problem. Uh, gives you a sense of the costs uh, involved in very personal terms. Obviously, it would also have an impact on our economy because if this family uh, has a couple of thousand dollars less to spend, that translates into $200 billion of less consumer spending next year. And, and that's bad for businesses large and small. Mm -hmm. It's bad for our economy. It means less folks are being hired. Uh, and we can be back in a downward spiral instead of the kind of uh, virtual si uh, virtuous cycle that we want to see. So uh, the message that uh, I got from uh, Tiffany and, and the message that I think we all want to send to members of Congress is this is a solvable problem. S the Senate has already passed a bill that would make sure that middle class taxes do not go up next year by a single dime. 98% of Americans whose incomes are $250,000 a year or less would not see any increases. 97% of small businesses would not see any increases in their income taxes. And even folks who make more than $250,000 would still have a tax break for their incomes up to $250,000. So 100% of Americans actually would be keeping uh, uh, a portion of their tax cuts, 98% of them. Uh, would not be seeing any increase in their income tax. Uh, that's the right thing to do for our economy. It's the right thing to do for families like uh, Tiffany's and Richard's. And it's very important that we get this done now, that we don't wait. Uh, you know, we're in, in, in the midst of the Christmas season. I think the American people are counting on this getting solved. The closer it gets to uh, the brink, uh, the more stress they're going to be. Businesses, uh, businesses are making decisions right now about investment and hiring. And if they don't have confidence that we can get this thing done, uh, then they're going to start pulling back. Uh, and uh, we could have a, a rocky time in our economy over the next uh, several months uh, or even next year. So uh, you know, I'm encouraged to see that uh, there's been some discussion uh, on the part of uh, Republicans uh, acknowledging the need for additional revenue. Uh, as I've indicated, the only way to get the kind of revenue for a balanced deficit reduction plan uh, is to make sure that we're also modestly increasing rates uh, for people who can afford it, folks like me. Uh, for folks uh, who are in the top 2%, uh, we can afford to have a modest rate increase. That allows us to not only reduce our deficit in a balanced, responsible way, it also allows us to make investments in education, in making college affordable, and putting folks back to work and investing in basic research that's uh, important for our economy. Uh, and uh, I think we all recognize that there are some smart cuts we've got to make in government. Uh, we're going to have to strengthen uh, our entitlement programs so that they're there for future generations. Uh, everybody's going to have to share in some sacrifice. But it starts with folks who are in the best position to sacrifice, who are in the best position to uh, do a little bit more, to, to step up. And, and that's what my plan does. Uh, so. Uh, just to be clear, uh, I'm not going to sign any package that uh, somehow prevents the top uh, rate from going up for folks uh, at the top 2%. Uh, but I do remain optimistic uh, that we can get something done that is good for families like uh, uh, this one and that is good for uh, the American economy. All right? Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it is good to be back in Michigan.
How's everybody doing today? Now let me just start off by saying uh, we have something in common. Both our teams lost yesterday. I mean, I, you know, I, I would like to come here and talk a little smack about the Bears, but we, uh, we, we didn't quite get it done. But uh, it, it is wonderful to be back. It is good to see everybody in the great state of Michigan. A few people I want to acknowledge. First of all, the mayor of Detroit here, Dave Bing, is in the house. We've got the Redford supervisor, Tracy Schultz Koblars. We've got some outstanding members of Congress who are here. Please give them a big round of applause. I want to thank Martin for hosting us. I want to thank Jeff and Gibby for giving me a great tour of the factory. I, I've got to say, I, I love coming to factories. I love you. So, but it, so in addition to seeing the best workers in the world, you've, got, you've also got all this cool equipment. I wanted to try out some of the equipment, but Secret Service wouldn't let me. They said, you're going to drop something on your head. Hurt yourself. They were worried I'd mess something up. And I, Jeff and Gibby may not admit it, but I think they were pretty happy that Secret Service wouldn't let me touch the equipment. <laughs> now, it, it, it's been a little over a month since the election came to an end. So. It's now safe for you to turn your televisions back on. All those scary political ads are off the air. You can answer your phone again. Nobody's calling you in the middle of dinner, asking for your support. Uh, but I have to, I, look, I have to admit, there, there's one part of the campaign that I miss, and that is, uh, it is a great excuse for me to get out of Washington and come to towns like this and talk to the people uh, who work so hard every day and are looking out for their families and are in their communities and, and, and just having a conversation about what kind of country do we want to be? What kind of country do we want to leave behind for our kids? Because ultimately that's what this is about. And I believe, and I've been saying this not just for the last six months or the last year, but ever since I got into public office, I believe America only succeeds and thrives when we've got a strong and growing middle class. That's what I believe. I believe we're at our best when everybody who works hard has a chance to get ahead. That they can get a job that pays the bills. That they've got health care they can count on. That they can retire with dignity and respect. Maybe take a vacation once in a while. Nothing fancy. You know, just, just, just being able to pack up the kids and, and, and go someplace and enjoy time with, with, with people that you love. Make sure that your kids can go to a good school. Make sure they can aspire to whatever they want to be. That idea is what built America. That's the idea that built Michigan. That's the idea that's at the heart of the economic plan I've been talking about all year long on the campaign trail. I want to give more Americans the chance to earn the skills that businesses are looking for right now and give our kids the kind of education they need to succeed in the 21st century. I want to make sure America leads the world in research and technology and clean energy. I want to put people back to work rebuilding our roads and our bridges and our schools. That's how we grow an economy. I want us to bring down our deficits, but I want to do it in a balanced, responsible way. 
And I want a reward, I want a tax code that rewards businesses and manufacturers like Detroit Diesel right here, creating jobs right here in Redford, right here in Michigan, right here in the United States of America. That's where we need to go. That's the country we need to build. And, and when it comes to bringing up manufacturing back to America, that's why I'm here today. Since 1938, Detroit Diesel has been turning out some of the best engines in the world. Over all those years, generations of Redford workers have walked through the, uh, these doors. Not just to punch a clock, not just to pick up a paycheck, not just to build an engine, but to build a, a middle-class life for their families, to earn a shot at the American dream. For seven and a half decades, through good times and bad, through revolutions in technology that sent a lot of good jobs, manufacturing jobs overseas, men and women like you, your parents, maybe even your grandparents, have done your part to build up America's manufacturing strength. And that's something you can all be proud of. And now you're writing a new proud chapter to that history. Eight years ago, you started building axles here alongside the engines. That meant more work, that meant more jobs. So you start seeing products, more products stamped with those three proud words made in America. Today, Daimler is announcing a new $120 million investment into this plant, creating 115 good new union jobs, building transmissions and turbochargers right here in Redford. $115 good new jobs right here in this plant, making things happen. That is great for the plant. It's great for this community. But it's also good for American manufacturing. Soon you guys will be building all the key parts that go into powering a heavy-duty truck all at the same facility. Nobody else in America is doing that. Nobody else in North America is doing that. And by putting everything together in one place, under one roof, Daimler engineers can design each part so it works better with the others. That means greater fuel efficiency for your trucks. It means greater savings for your customers. That's a big deal. And it's just the latest example of Daimler's leadership on this issue. Last year, I was proud to have your support when we announced the first ever national fuel efficiency standards for commercial trucks which is going to help save consumers money and reduce our dependence on foreign oil. That's good news. But here's the other reason why uh, what you guys are doing, what Daimler is doing, is so important. For a long time, companies, they weren't always making those kinds of investments here in the United States. They weren't always investing in American workers. They certainly weren't willing to make them in the U.S. auto industry. Remember, it was just a few years ago that our auto industry was on the verge of collapse. GM, Chrysler were all on the brink of failure. And if they failed, the suppliers and distributors that get their business from those companies, they would have died off too. Even Ford could have gone down. Production halted. Factories shuttered. Once proud companies chopped up, sold off for scraps. And all of you, the men and women who built these companies with your own hands would have been hung out to dry. And everybody in this community that depends on you, restaurant owners, storekeepers, bartenders, <laughs> they, <laughs> their livelihoods would have been at stake too. So I wasn't about to let that happen. I placed my bet on American workers. We bet on American ingenuity. 
I'd make that same bet any day of the week. Three and a half years later, that bet is paying off. This industry's added over a quarter of a million new jobs. Assembly lines are humming again. American auto industry is back. And companies like Daimler know you're still a smart bet. They could have made their investment somewhere else, but they didn't. And if you ask them whether it was a tough call, they'll tell you it wasn't even close. So the word's going out all around the world. If you want to find the best workers in the world, you want to find the best factories in the world, you want to build the best cars or trucks or any other product in the world, you should invest in the United States of America. This is the place to do it. So you're, you're starting to see the, the, the competitive balance is tipping a little bit. Over the past few years, it's become more expensive to do business in countries like China. Our workers have become more productive. Our energy costs are starting to go down here in the United States, and we still have the largest market. So when you factor in everything, it makes sense to invest here in America. And that's one of the reasons why American manufacturing is growing at the fastest pace since the 1990s. And thanks in part to the boost in manufacturing, four years after the worst economic crisis of our lifetimes, our economy is growing again. Our businesses have created more than a uh, five and a half million new jobs over the past 33 months. So, so we're making progress. We're moving in the right direction. We're going forward. So what we need to do is simple. We need to keep going. We need to keep going forward. We should do everything we can to keep creating good middle-class jobs that help folks rebuild security for their families. And, and we should do everything we can to encourage companies like Daimler to keep investing in American workers. And by the way, what we shouldn't do, I just got to say this, what we shouldn't be doing is trying to take away your rights to bargain for better wages and working for this. We shouldn't be doing that. These so-called right-to-work laws, they don't have to do with economics. They have everything to do with politics. What they're really talking about is giving you the right to work for less money. You only have to look to Michigan, where workers were instrumental in reviving the auto industry to see how unions have helped build not just a stronger middle class, but a stronger America. So folks from uh, our state's capital all the way to the nation's capital, they should be focused on the same thing. They should be working to make sure companies like this manufacturer get, is able to make more great products. That's what they should be focused on. Not, we, we, we don't want a race to the bottom. We want a race to the top. We, America, America's not going to compete based on low skill, low wage, no workers' rights. That's not, that's not, our, that's not our competitive advantage. There's always going to be some other country that can treat its workers even worse. Right? What, what, what's going to make us succeed is we got the best workers, well-trained, Reliable, productive, low turnover, healthy. That's what makes us strong. And it also is what allows our workers then to buy the products that we make. Because they got enough money in their pockets. So, so, so we've got to get past this whole situation where 
we, we manufacture crises because of politics that actually leads to less certainty, more conflict, and we can't all focus on coming together to grow. And, 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 and the same thing, we, we're, we're seeing the same thing in Washington. I'm sure you've all heard the talk recently about some big deadlines we're facing in a few weeks when it comes to decisions on jobs and investment and taxes. And that debate's going to have a big amp impact on all of you. Uh, some of you may know this. If Congress doesn't act soon, meaning in the next few weeks, starting on January 1st, everybody's going to see their income taxes go up. It's true. You all don't like that, huh? <laughs> Typical middle-class family of four will see an income tax hike of around $2,200. How many of you can afford to pay another $2,200 in taxes? Not you? No, I didn't think so. You can't afford to lose that money. That's a hit you can't afford to take. And by the way, that's not a good hit for businesses either. Because if Congress lets middle class taxes go up, economists will tell you that means people will spend nearly $200 billion less than they otherwise would spend. Right? Consumer spending is going to go down. That means you've got less customers. Businesses get fewer profits. They hire fewer workers. You go in a downward spiral. Wrong idea. Here's the good news. We can solve this problem. All Congress needs to do is pass a law that would prevent a tax hike on the first $250,000 of everybody's income. Everybody. That means, that means 98 percent of Americans, and probably 100 percent of you, 97 percent of small businesses wouldn't see their income taxes go up a single dime. Even, even the wealthiest Americans would still get a tax cut on the first $250,000 of their income. But when they start making a million or, you know, 10 million or 20 million, you can afford to pay a little bit more. You know, you're, you're not. You're not too strapped. So, so Congress can do that right now. Everybody says they agree with it. Let's get it done. Now, so, so, so that's the bare minimum. That's the bare minimum we should be doing in order to grow the economy. But we can do more. We can do more than just extend middle class tax cuts. I've said I will work with Republicans on a plan for economic growth, job creation, and reducing our deficits, and that has some compromise between Democrats and Republicans. I understand there's a, you know, people have a lot of different views. I'm willing to compromise a little bit. But if we're serious about reducing our def deficit, we've also got to be serious about investing in the things that help us grow and make the middle class strong, like education and research and development and making sure kids can go to college and rebuilding our roads and our infrastructure. We got to do that. So, so when you put it all together, what you need is a package that keeps taxes where they are for middle class families. We make some tough spending cuts on things that we don't need. And then we ask the wealthiest Americans to pay a slightly higher tax rate. And, and that's a, a principle I won't compromise on because I'm not going to have a situation where the wealthiest among us including folks like me, get to keep all our tax breaks, and then we're asking students to pay higher student loans. Or, you know, suddenly, you know, a, a school doesn't have school books because the school district couldn't afford it. Or some family that has a dis disabled kid isn't getting the help that they need through Medicaid. We're not going to do that. We're not going to make that trade-off. That's not going to help us to grow. Our economic success has never come from the top down. It comes from the middle out. It comes from the bottom up. It comes from folks like you working hard. And if you're working hard and you're successful, then you become customers and everybody does well. Our success as a country in this new century will be defined by how well we educate our kids, how well we train our workers, how well we invent, how well we innovate, 
how well we build things like cars and engines, all the things that helped create the greatest middle class the world's ever known. That's how you bring new jobs back to Detroit. That's how you bring good jobs back to America. That's what I'm focused on. That's what I will stay relentlessly focused on going forward. Because when we focus on these things, when we stay true to ourselves and our history, there's nothing we can't do. And if you don't believe me, you need to come down to this plant and see all these outstanding workers. In fact, I, as I was coming over here, I was hearing about a guy named Willie. Where's Willie? Where's Willie right here? Where's Willie? Now, uh, in case, uh, where's Willie? In case, in case you haven't heard of him, they actually call him Pretty Willie. Now, I got to say, you got to be pretty tough to have a nickname like Pretty Willie. He's tough. On Wednesday, Willie will celebrate 60 years working at Detroit Diesel. 60 years. Willie started back on December 12, 1952. I was not born yet. <laughs> Wasn't even close to being born. He made a, a dollar forty an hour. Only time he spent away from this plant was when he was serving our country in the Korean War. So three generations of Willie's family have passed through Detroit Diesel. One of his daughters works here with him right now. Is that right? There she is. In all his years, Willie's been late to work only once. It was back in 1977. It's been so long, he can't remember why he was late. But we're willing to give him a pass. So Willie believes in hard work. You don't keep a job for 60 years if you don't work hard. Sooner or later, somebody's going to fire you if you don't work hard. He takes pride in being, some, being part of something bigger than himself. He, he, he's committed to family. He's committed to community. He's committed to country. That's how Willie lives his life. That's how all of you live your lives. And that's, that makes me hopeful about the future. Because you're out there fighting every day for a better future for your family and your country. And, and when you do that, that means, you know, you're, you're creating value all across this economy. You're inspiring people. You're being a good example for your kids. That's what makes America great. That's what we have to stay focused on. And as long as I've got the privilege of serving as your president, I'm going to keep fighting for you. I'm going to keep fighting for your kids. I'm going to keep fighting for an America where anybody, no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, no matter where you come from, you can make it in the try here in America. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. Thank you. God bless America. Good afternoon, everybody. Over the last few weeks, I've been working with leaders of both parties on a proposal to get our deficit under control, avoid tax cuts or avoid tax hikes on the middle class, and to make sure that we can spur jobs and economic growth. A balanced proposal that cuts spending but also asks the wealthiest Americans to pay more, a proposal that will strengthen the middle class over the long haul and grow our economy over the long haul. During the course of these negotiations, I offered to compromise with Republicans in Congress. I met them halfway on taxes, and I met them more than halfway on spending. And in terms of actual dollar amounts, we're not that far apart. As of today, 
uh, I am still ready and willing to get a comprehensive package done. I still believe that reducing our deficit is the right thing to do for the long-term health of our economy and the confidence of our businesses. Uh, I remain committed to working towards that goal, whether it happens all at once or whether it happens in several different steps. But in 10 days, we face a deadline. In 10 days, under current law, tax rates are scheduled to rise on most Americans. And even though Democrats and Republicans are arguing about whether those rates should go up for the wealthiest individuals, all of us, every single one of us, agrees that tax rates shouldn't go up for the other 98 percent of Americans, which includes 97 percent of small businesses. Every member of Congress believes that. Every Democrat, every Republican. So there is absolutely no reason, none, not to protect these Americans from a tax hike. At the very least, let's agree right now on what we already agree on. Let's get that done. I just spoke to Speaker Boehner, uh, and I also met with Senator Reid. In the next few days, I've asked leaders of Congress to work towards a package that prevents a tax hike on middle-class Americans, protects unemployment insurance for 2 million Americans, and lays the groundwork for further work on both growth and deficit reduction. That's an achievable goal. That can get done in 10 days. Once this legislation is agreed to, I expect Democrats and Republicans to get back to Washington and have it pass both chambers. And I will immediately sign that legislation into law before January 1st of next year. It's that simple. Averting this middle class tax hike is not a Democratic responsibility or a Republican responsibility. With their votes, the American people have determined that governing is a shared responsibility between both parties. In this Congress, laws can only pass with support from Democrats and Republicans. And that means nobody gets 100 percent of what they want. Everybody's got to give a little bit in a sensible way. We move forward together or we don't move forward at all. So uh, as we leave town for a few days to be with our families for the holidays, uh, I hope uh, it gives everybody some perspective. Everybody can cool off. Everybody can drink some eggnog, have some Christmas cookies, sing, sing some uh, Christmas carols, uh, enjoy the company of loved ones. And then I'd ask every member of Congress, uh, while they're back home, to think about that. Think about the obligations we have to the people who sent us here. Think about the hardship that so many Americans will endure if Congress does nothing at all. Just as our economy is really starting to recover, and we're starting to see optimistic signs, and we've seen actually uh, some upside statistics uh, from a whole range of areas, including housing, now's not the time for more self-inflicted wounds, certainly not those coming from Washington. And there's so much more work to be done in this country on jobs and on incomes, education and energy. We're a week away from one of the worst tragedies in memory. Uh, so we've got work to do on gun safety, host of other issues. These are all challenges that we can meet. They're all challenges that we have to meet if we want our kids to grow up in an America that's full of opportunity and possibility as much opportunity and possibility as the America that our parents and our grandparents left for us. But we're only going to be able to do it together. We're going to have to find some common ground. And the challenge that we've got right now is that the American people are a lot more sensible and a lot more thoughtful and much more willing to compromise and give and sacrifice and act responsibly than their elected representatives are. And that's a problem. There's a mismatch right now between how everybody else is thinking about these problems, Democrats and Republicans, outside of this town and how folks are operating here. And we've just got to get that aligned. But we've only got 10 days to do it. 
So uh, I hope that every member of Congress is thinking about that. Nobody can get 100 percent of what they want. And this is not simply a contest between parties in terms of who looks good and who doesn't. There are real world consequences to what we do here. And I want next year to be a year of strong economic growth. I want next year to be a year in which more jobs are created and more businesses are started. And we're making progress on all the challenges that we have out there, some of which, by the way, uh, we don't have as much control over as we have in terms of just shaping a sensible budget. This is something within our capacity to solve. It doesn't take that much work. We just have to do the right thing. So uh, call me a uh, uh, hopeless optimist, but I actually still think we can get it done. Uh, and with that, I want to wish every American a Merry Christmas. And, uh, you know, because we didn't get this done, I will see you next week. Sir, All right?